Okay, so today's talk is uh, is based on three papers. I will show you three proofs, one from each of these papers, <laughs> and uh, this invention for this uh, on this occasion by collaborators. Uh, that is this Hannah Bin, uh, Andreas Lukas, uh, Mahmoud Parham, and Stefan Schmidt. Okay, so let me start. Um, this is a networking uh, workshop, so why I'm talking about some graphs. So, so let me first start with the motivation. I will explain from where the graph is coming from and what does it mean to partition it. So the motivation is in embedding virtual machines in, in data centers. So we take an abstract view of the communication pattern, which, which is a virtual network. Some nodes communicate, some don't. And uh, there is a task to embed this abstract thing on a real data center. And the data center, how I presented with this very simplified figure, consists of here only two servers, each having a capacity to run three virtual machines. And because network is such an important part of um, of the runtime of, uh, of jobs that run in the data centers, we want to expose as little traffic in between the servers and keep as much inside. So this, uh, these green uh, edges in this particular mapping, we can figure they are for free and the red ones are costly. In general, uh, data centers can be more complicated than just a story example. And so here, in this abstract view, this is a virtual machine, and these, uh, these are RAC servers. There are many ways to embed a, uh, a virtual network, and some of them are more efficient than the other. So, the, so it, is a, it is a task of, of, uh, of high importance in, uh, in, the, in the data center to do it right. But this view is static. So this is what I don't like about this view. This view assumes that, okay, from the day, let's say that, this, that, uh, that, um, that the virtual network communicates, and after some time we see which nodes communicated with, with which other nodes. Uh, but in reality, there is also the time dimension. They communicate over time. The traffic pattern is shifting. So here, for example, we can see how such a pattern can evolve. We can think that these communication patterns happen over time. And this type of a static view that just sums it up loses some important information that we can, that we can use. And how we can use them. There's a powerful tool to optimize our uh, network utilization. It is called a virtual machine migration. So at any time we can uh, uh, we can freeze a machine and we can resume it on the on, the, on a different uh, server in hopes to save network uh, communication between these machines. Yes, uh, transferring a machine also costs something, but we'll model it soon. So in this view that I have, uh, in this model, a migration cannot cannot exist on its own. We cannot say that one virtual machine is going somewhere else because our servers are most likely running on the edge of their capacity anyway. So it's, it has to be swapped rather than uh, just migrated wherever we want. Uh, and here, this traffic pattern is, can be expensive in a data center that looks like this. It's a very simple one, uh, but it's just to get a point. Uh, so first the, the orange node communicates with the white node, and then the orange node communicates with the black node. With help of migration, we can pay just the network cost of migration rather than this potentially huge cost of, uh, of communication that cannot be handled statically uh, without exposing, um, without communicating uh, in between servers. So static embeddings and it can be inherently inefficient. Uh, this is a static embedding, and it always exposes the edge. So with red, I usually denote the cost of the communication. 
Okay, to model this this aspect of data center communication, we um, we propose a model, and the, and this model one can see that it is uh, it is it might you might see if you know something about maybe. If you know some uh, results from online algorithms, you might see some resemblances to uh, to online paging in the in the design of this model uh, or online caching, in other in other words, so this uh, generalization of, of this of this model. So how this model works? Um, input is just the increments of the edges. So an edge appears, and now it has to be served. How much this uh, serving of this uh, of this edge costs? It depends on the configuration of the algorithm, uh, precisely on the mapping uh, of the servers. Uh, and if internal communication costs zero, external communication costs one, and the migration costs uh, alpha, which is a parameter. I will not talk too much about this parameter. We can assume that it's is going to be arbitrary. Our proofs will work for arbitrary uh, values of parameters. And the goal is to minimize the total cost. Uh, I must say that the migration can happen before certain delivery. <laughs> some choices <laughs> have to be made. This one works. Well, there is not too much difference between these models. Okay, so besides alpha, which I from time to time will mention, which is the migration cost, I also denote uh, K and by K and L two important as dimensions of our uh, data center. So K is the capacity of, uh, of each of our <coughs> servers, and L is the number of, uh, the number of servers that, that we have. I will remind you from time to time. But yeah. Okay, uh, so the algorithmic problem. What are the algorithmic decisions that we have to, to do as, as an online algorithm? We have to decide when to migrate virtual machines around the data center and when. Sometimes we might not want to migrate, although there are some requests, because we are waiting for, for more convincing uh, flows to appear. And uh, sometimes we want to migrate multiple machines in reaction to certain events. Actually, most algorithms work like this. They, they move batches of virtual machines around. So the algorithmic challenges in designing an effective solution to this problem is one, that the future requests are unknown. And when we, for example, we, uh, we decided these two communicate a lot, and we want to collocate them on one server, where to collocate it? On the left server or on the right server? If we decide on the left server, what to evict from the left server? Because, well, we cannot just add it. We will have to move something out. And also there's another dimension, which is serve remotely or migrate. So with respect to this parameter alpha of migration cost, it might be sometimes not worth it to react to a certain pattern because it might be just temporary. And this is, by the way, also in online algorithms uh, referred to as rainbow pie problem. Here, our analytical toolbox will be competitive analysis. It's just a fancy name for approximation algorithms in case of online decision making. So we want to minimize the ratio of the algorithm's cost to ops cost where op is special because it knows the future. And our alg is the online algorithm. So it had to react to, um, on the fly to, uh, to requests. It doesn't know the future. So in this talk, my goal is to convince you that there are two cases. K equals one and K equal to three or even larger than three, and those are fundamentally different. I want to convince you about this method. So first, so now I will present three proofs that will go towards convincing you. Um, in fact, all three will be lower bounds. So it is insufficient to say that, uh, that they distinguish, but I will also have uh, an algorithmic uh, result mentioned. So let me start with, with a lower bound for K uh, that is uh, <coughs> Uh, that is at least two. So for any any such a such an online problem, so k must be at least two. So non-deterministic online algorithm can be better than free competitive, which means that the ratio of R to op is never is uh, cannot 
We cannot have an algorithm that for each input sequence attains a better cost ratio. So for, to construct this, we consider the simple uh, two by two example of two uh, k equals two, l equals two, two servers of capacity two each. And we focus our attention on three particular nodes from this, uh, from this data center. And our input sequence is the following. We basically try to be as rude to the algorithm as possible. So if the algorithms, okay, each request will concern the node A, but sometimes A communicates with C, sometimes A communicates with B. So if the algorithm has A and B co-located, then we request A and C. We can do it because uh, we are constructing a lower bound against deterministic algorithms, so we know exactly what they do. So, if, uh, so there are only these two types of requests. We look at what the algorithm has and we exactly ask him the, the, the cost of request, which is, by the way, uh, uh, a usual construction in online algorithms, which is called the cruel input sequence. So we fixed a sequence of R requests. So now I'm defining two variables, R and M. So for for a request that continues in the way that I just described for our request, we assume that alg migrates, so it in total pays m for migrations. The cost of the algorithm is then r plus m, migrations plus serving the request in between the servers. And our goal is to show that alg divided by op is never lower than three. Uh, we do it by concretizing what the op does. To bound opt, I will define three offline algorithms. The two first two reside in a static configuration. One prefers A and B, the second prefers A and C. They have them for free. They never migrate from the, from the point. They just reach this configuration, they never migrate. And there is a weird offline algorithm. It is D as dynamic. It does the opposite of what the out online algorithm does. It looks at what the algorithm does and it does the opposite. So if alg has A and B co-located, then, then the offline algorithm has A and C. And the other way around. This makes sense because our input sequence is cruel. So if the algorithm pays, this offline D does not pay. So this is the analysis. Let me tell you what exactly is the meaning here. So, M is the cost of the total, my, total cost of migrations for the algorithm. R is the uh, total number of requests, which is exactly also the cost of, uh, of all the requests. In total, the first two offline algorithms pay exactly R. So every request is either to AC or AB, which means that in total, their cost is exactly equal to R, which is the number of requests. On the other hand, that this uh, third offline algorithm just pays for migrations because every time it, it tries to mirror the algorithm. So every time the algorithm switches, then this offline also switches. So it pays exactly the same cost of, uh, as the algorithm for migrations and it never pays for any request because how we define the request sequence. And that optimal offline algorithm's cost is never worse uh, than the cost of any of those algorithms. So it is smaller than the minimum. Then we use the relationship between the minimum and the average to attain the cost of uh, one third of M plus R. Why one third? Because there are three algorithms, uh, offline algorithms we average over. There are some additional costs here. They are due to reaching the configuration initially. So for example, from the initial configuration, we need to move one of these algorithms. So we pay some small cost, but it doesn't matter because the ratio uh, converges to three. Okay, oh, it's already half of my talk, it's really bad. Uh, so the algorithm for k equals two is very simple. We just, uh, we just count the, the number of communication requests that we've seen so far between each pair of nodes. And upon any, any counter uh, reaching the threshold alpha, which alpha is the cost of migration, this is when we trigger some action. And this action, what we do is upon a certain edge 
uh, saturate to the value of alpha is we reset all the counters of these nodes that were uh, participating in this uh, uh, that are in this server in these two servers and uh, and we do a swap uh, so now they are now they are collocated and we do not reset the other counters so I claim that this algorithm is six competitive but I will skip the proof uh, it is simple but tedious instead I will tell you what is another interpretation of k equals two case because who has data centers that can that the server can only host two VMs? This is not too much. So uh, mm, another interpretation of this configuration from our original problem is to is to think of in terms of uh, free space optics in a data center. So you have a, a mirror in the cell, and each of your uh, each of your servers ha has a a laser, yeah, perfect, and uh, and they can form a matching. So the matching is exactly what was originally here. The cost model is exactly the same because we say that if the optical is fast, then uh, then uh, it is for free if we can route the packet through this optical network. And in case there is no direct connection, we have to use a slow electric network. So we covered k equals 2k's, and now what I'm going to tell you, if time permits, is to, uh, is to tackle two dimensions in which the, uh, our data center can grow. So one is that we have more capacity, and other is that we have more servers. Okay, this, this algorithm handled all sorts of servers, all numbers of servers, but when K is at least free, which is the capacity is at least free, it does no, no longer work. So with K at least free, uh, some different things will happen. Okay, so I will show you two lower bounds now, if time permits. So this is the setting that we are now looking into. Uh, there are only two servers, but K is at least free. So now I'm going to tell that this is, um, that this problem is hard from the online optimization perspective because it will have a non-constant lower bound. So for example, the, the, the previous problem was six competitive. Okay, no, no better than three, uh, but there's a gap between three and six. And now our competitiveness grow, will grow with K, which means that this is counterintuitive because it means that our algorithm does way, way worse as we add more uh, capacity to our servers. Yeah, so that's that's exactly what I'm going to uh, to show you. This I will do it by reduction to paging. So paging is probably uh, is, okay. It is, in my opinion, the the problem why online algorithms exist. Paging is also known as caching. So a very simple problem is uh, done like this: that we have a fast memory, we have slow memory. Access to fast memory costs zero. Access to slow memory costs one. And uh, we can fetch in the, between this, uh, these two memories by a cost of one again. And uh, this problem, I think, probably the most of the literature of online algorithms. And there is a known, uh, known result that no algorithm can be better than k competitive, no online algorithm for paging. And this uh, online graph partitioning will have equally bad uh, result. By reduction from paging, I will show you that uh, this competitive lower bound is inherited. So the reduction works as follows. The left server, I, can, I, should, I will think about it as a cache. We should think about it as a cache. And there are, uh, okay, one more disclaimer. The paging, this uh, lower bound of K also holds if slow memory has only one cell, which is funny to think about, but, uh, but it also works. And we will use it. So, consider an instance of paging with cache of size k and k plus one items. This, and now I want to translate it to um, to this graph partitioning world, with where these white nodes they correspond directly to the pages from uh, from paging, and the left cluster is a cache. The right cluster is could be thought as the slow memory, but there are 
but this, this is larger. So what we do is we basically block it with a special set of nodes that we will treat differently. They will, I will call them helper nodes, and their goal is to reduce the size of this uh, right-hand size cluster. And we set the migration cost to one, just not to, not to think about it. Just to, okay, to have it as similar to pain as possible. So what are we going to do to, to translate an input sequence from paging to graph partitioning? So first, we talk about this helper node. Uh, so every time an algorithm splits these nodes, we say that it's behaved badly and we punish it for it by requesting these nodes. So every time an algorithm splits these this helper nodes, we incur the request until it goes back or incurs potentially infinite cost. We can do it without ignoring this request because our offline algorithm will never split nodes. So it will not pay anything for such request because it behaves right. Uh, okay, so the reduction is uh, has one one thing that is completely different from paging to graph partitioning is that graph partitioning is the generalization of caching where requests do not come to individual pages or individual nodes, but rather they come to pairs of nodes because these are communication requests. So what we need to do is given a sequence of pages uh, of requests to pages we want to produce a sequence of pairs, uh, but how? These are pages, so we, we should, for each page that we are requesting, because it comes from this input sequence we are just translating, it, uh, mm, it has to find its counterpart. So this should, the first one should be exactly the page, but the second one is kind of unknown. And how to do it, how to solve this problem? We solve this problem by looking at already, on the translation time of an input sequence to already looking at an optimal algorithm for paging, and we determine what page this offline algorithm, this optimal offline algorithm for sure has in its cache. And this is exactly the, the, the page that we are going to add to, uh, to this mix. Uh, so this requires knowledge of the entire input sequence in advance, and uh, yeah, and it, it requires to look at the uh, at the cache of of it because we want this we want this property that uh, if we are requesting something that the algorithm has in cache, it pays zero and otherwise it pays one. And uh, yeah, maybe I will skip uh, saying why it happens. So uh, if algorithms behave well, which means they never split nodes. Uh, their cost is exactly the same in graph partitioning model as in paging model, hence we inherit the lower bound of k. Okay, the last proof, if we still have, we have five minutes, maybe that's good. So the last proof is concerning the case where k is equal to three and we have a, 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 lot of, uh, a lot of servers. And now the lower bound grows with the number of servers. This is such a bad result, such a, such a negative result, because now it says that Online algorithms do worse and worse the larger our data centers are, not only in the capacity, but also in the number of servers. I will show it only for k equals three for simplicity, but in general, one, in one of our papers, we showed it that it's, um, that both lower bounds that I'm showing now and I showed before, they can be combined to get a stronger result of lower bound of k times l, which is even worse. There are two ideas that we will employ in this, in this lower bound. One is the set of unsplittable nodes. It is similar to what you already saw with helper nodes. We'll just use it multiple times. And there are pivot nodes. So let's say, uh, to, okay, now I will define the pivot. So consider a cluster, so, uh, sorry, a server. This is the first server, it is a special server. It has an unsplittable uh, pair of nodes. That, uh, this is why I grade them out, because they, they cannot be, be split. And the one, the node that is uh, that is there with them, is called a pivot. And in the construction, there will be three concepts. So the first request will be special, and then the next request will be uh, will be kind of from the same tail. But the first one is special, just to like kick things off. And we repeat requests if Alk splits what he should not split again with the same with this assumption that. 
our offline algorithm will not split them, so this we can do it. Okay, so what happens with the kid? Let's say that we have this pair of uh, of, uh, of nodes that we cannot split. Whenever we request a pivot and something else, the algorithm must collocate it somewhere uh, somewhere else than in this first uh, uh, cluster because there's simply no space there. So it has to has to choose a server and this communicating pair has to be moved somewhere. If it does, if it's stubborn and it doesn't move, we just repeat the process because the offline algorithm will have them collocated somewhere. When we do this, this pivot that was previously here is replaced with a new pivot. Inevitably, because our uh, data center is fully populated with virtual machine, some other virtual machine has to come and take the space of the previous pivot. So here, to, uh, we evicted the orange node, and now it's the pivot. And the idea is to repeat it roughly L times, because we can, we can have pivots that, uh, a, a request to pivot and something else. We repeat it L times in hopes to incur the cost of L. But what to request with the, with the pivot? There are, okay, there are two, two, two challenges. What to request with the pivot and when to stop this process? Because if we just continue and continue until we can no longer continue this process, it is not a proper lower bound because opt is not cheap. We want to uh, terminate when there still exists a cheap offline solution. Okay, two minutes. Uh, okay, what to do, how to determine X? Uh, we look at the initial configuration, we color the nodes as they were starting with this, uh, where they were before, of, as their server of origin. And the first request is uh, has two colors, but the, all the next requests will have the same color. So we'll, they will come initially from the same server. So these are the original colors of the server. And uh, yeah. So I will probably not be able to continue this, uh, this talk. So yeah, basically we are choosing this as the as the counterpart to the the pivot. We are choosing the item of the the, the node of the same color, and then there exists a cheap offline solution, and we repeat this process until there is a cluster that is absolutely untouched. If there are no untouched clusters, untouched means that it was never a pivot, never was requested then we have to stop when we still have one of them because this is where opt will hide its two initial, uh, this initial request and the opt will only pay for this one by moving it to some place where opt is giving something. Okay, <coughs> that's roughly it. And this is the analysis, out phase L minus two, opt phase one, in number of quotes. Okay, to wrap things up, uh, today we were discussing the K equals two which is a constant competitor. When we generalize in either direction of K or L, it linearly depends on it. And there was a, uh, and for this case, when K and L is arbitrary, we show this lower bound of L times K, but the community had trouble reaching this uh, tightness of the, of, 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 by given an algorithm. And still an optimal algorithm is not known. And so we gave, a k squared times l squared algorithm that is rather simple, that it was uh, improved to an exponential in k, in linear in l, and just recently uh, in ESA 22, uh, there is this k times l times log k, which is not yet there, but coming close. Uh, and also some interesting few read on these papers are from a very simple, of, of, on a simpler variant, where uh, once a pair of nodes started to communicate, they communicate forever, so you cannot split them. This is called the learning variant, and it was uh, a topic of a Sigmetrics paper and then a SODA paper. And, oh, this is 2009. This is 2019, not 16. Uh, yeah, that's all from my side. Thank you. We do have some time for questions because the last half an hour of our session is basically just an open questions or open discussion session. So if you have any questions, you know, feel free to ask them. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the talk.
I would have a question about your analogy earlier about this uh, ceiling with the lasers. Sure. I mean, there you said it works for k equals to 2, right? And what happens with the model, or what can you say, let's say, if everyone can have two lasers or three? Or yeah, that's different than, than k equals 3, because when you have k equals 3, all three nodes can communicate like mm -hmm. this. So you need to seek for different abstractions if you want to add uh, multiple matching. That's also, uh, that there are also some papers on such a model uh, by Stefan Schmidt. Okay, by the way, this is, uh, this is the model that was proposed in the projector uh, on the SIPCOM, projector paper by Mania Gobadi, yeah. uh, SIPCOM 2016. So, so if, if I would have, let's say, if I want to extend this, then I would need to have some model, let's say, for three nodes, say, then they form an optical cube or something. Yes, then it is exactly the same. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're right. Uh, so you have chosen an arbitrary alpha from my building plot. Um, uh, does yes. it make it simple if alpha becomes big? Big? Uh, okay, so one of the biggest the challenges... Would, what would, so sorry, the intuition would be that uh, if you, for example, count onto alpha or until you have communicated alpha half times, and then you move, then you could come to perhaps something which is more two-competitive. Right? Um, yes, so... This is exactly the, the rental by the ski rental problem, uh, where it indeed can attain to competitiveness, but this model just has different dimensions, even in k equals 2 case, that this allow uh, such a strong result. Okay, what happens with where, there, where alpha is larger? So one of our, okay, one of our design uh, goals was to abstract from alpha and handle any alpha, so to never have alpha in the competitive ratio. And so this is this one of the successes, that this model is not degenerated in a sense that the, the more costly your migration cost is, the worse your algorithm does, because that would make no sense. Uh, yeah, so we assumed large alpha, but everything <coughs> works just fine for small values of alpha, although they are not of a huge practical importance. So high alpha, large alpha, as you just said, this, may, uh, this is important. Uh, this is the important case. Yeah. Yeah, the migration cost should be much, much uh, larger than a single communication request between between uh, between two virtual machines. Maybe we shouldn't do it on a practice basis uh, because it would be expensive to to track. But the packages of of, uh, of of certain number of packets uh, that are traceable should be much slower, much smaller than. Uh, the actual cost of migration. We have time for one more question. Of course, one might say now that, okay, these are like pathological cases, right, that you come up with, uh, so to get these worst case results. Uh, what about typical cases or the average case? Um, mm -hmm. Do you know something about that? Have you ever looked at this? Or? Yes, that's a Okay, so I can answer it in a way how the communi community answered the same problems with caching. Mm -hmm. Because caching also has this pathological uh, input sequences that make it k-competitive, which is not something that, not a phenomenon that we observe in practice. So uh, there are multiple ways to approach it and they are usually beyond the competitive analysis, beyond the worst case of, 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 of algorithms. Uh, we can assume, for example, distribution of, of inputs. We can assume, uh, okay, maybe I will tell you about the, okay. Very often we are, in caching, for example, we are assuming certain locality in the access pattern. So how often a certain page is requested. Uh, or, yeah, <coughs> that needs to have uh, also a temporal di dimension to it. Uh, but, uh, but locality is, could, Locality studies could explain the performance of this uh, of such algorithms better, uh, just like the average average case analysis, which I suppose that you are referring to some distributions over over inputs. So in online algorithms, like for the the moods of the community are shifting from these models. Now the competitive analysis is the is the hot thing. Okay, 
of what they did when it was introduced in the 80s. But it's still the, the method that is, um, that is the most prevalent in the community to, uh, to abstract from, the, from distribution of uh, aspects. And there is one very interesting uh, way of looking at the co at competitive analysis. There, there was, <coughs> there was proposed an alternative uh, method of, of measuring the quality of online algorithms. It is called loose competitiveness. So, on an example of caching, you, we are fine with an al when the algorithm satisfies one of the two conditions. One, either its competitive ratio is really low, which means that it does very well in, term, in, in comparison to the optimum, or its absolute cost is very low. Because, well, if it does not make too many page faults, who cares that we are way worse than the off offline algorithm? Because we are already in the ter territories of good performance anyway. So we don't have to say how bad we did. So there are hopes for similar results for this problem as well. Uh, but I think that no one is studying uh, the distribution and analysis because it just came out of fashion and is uh, at least on the, in, the online, in, the, in the online community. On, on, I'm only talking about the online community because everywhere else this same assumption makes sense. But distributional analysis has problems because, for example, we cannot model then shifts in patterns. And migrations in data centers are all about temporal shifting uh, in uh, patterns, mm -hmm. which the, okay, the distribution analysis is perfect for the static model, uh, for the static model. Uh, however, I think that, uh, that maybe we need more dynamic models. But there are definitely other phases of average case analysis, not only distribution analysis. There's a huge literature and a, re a really great book by Kim Rothgarden on beyond box case analysis. That's where my answer to you guys come. Okay, thanks again.